thank you for uh, that great introduction. And I can say that I am a big enthusiast of the plant-based diet. Um, and my area of expertise, as was mentioned in the introduction, is superbugs. And there was a time not too long ago uh, when I was busy working on this book and I was sitting at the dinner table across from my wife, who was a physician, and I could see that she was very deep in thought. And I had a stack of fungal journals on the dining table and I was busy at work. And I saw her squinting and I said, what are you thinking about? And she said, of all the guys in the world, how did I end up married to the yeast infection guy? <laughs> and for better or worse, that is what I am known as uh, at my hospital. I'm a staff physician at New York Presbyterian, which is based in Manhattan, and we have satellite campuses all over um, New York, I'm probably gonna have some near here soon. Um, but I begin by telling you that because this idea of superbugs um, encompasses a whole wide variety of infectious diseases, which is my specialty. And traditionally, superbugs have been thought to be drug-resistant bacteria. But we now know that it's a much bigger issue than that, that superbugs also pertains to drug-resistant parasites, drug-resistant fungi, things like yeast and mold, uh, and also drug-resistant viruses. And in the course of the, today's talk, we'll cover all kinds of, of, uh, of superbugs, um, including some of the first to be identified and then some of the newest ones that have just um, been in the news lately, such as the coronavirus from the Wuhan province. And I want today to be interactive. Um, I'm gonna talk for a while, and then I'm gonna open it up for questions because I know that there is a, a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of confusion, but there's also a lot of, uh, of very interesting thoughts that you may have, and I, I often learn something just listening to um, people in the crowd. And before I get going, I'll say probably the most interesting question I've ever gotten was in Richmond, Virginia, a man raised his hand and said, you know how locusts were cast upon the earth in the Bible as a judgment for human behavior. Do you think superbugs were cast upon the earth as a judgment for our behavior? And that video of me answering that question is on C-SPAN, you can Google it. Um, but it caught me off guard and there was quite a bit of fumbling uh, before I was able to answer the question, which is yes, um, we have contributed substantially to superbugs. Um, and I'm gonna get to how that happened. And then I also wanna put this all in perspective. I think we all have enough to worry about day in and day out that I want this to be calibrated appropriately on your list of things that concern you. Uh, because I'm an infectious disease specialist and when I go home at night to my two young children and my wife, I'm not worried that I'm going to be transmitting some deadly thing to them even though that's what I spend all day dealing with. And so I wanna, highlight why this is important, how we got here and what we're doing about it, but also put it in some perspective. So I want to begin by telling you a little bit about the book that I wrote, Superbugs. So a few years ago, I was trying to figure out how do I talk about this issue? Because I was getting, as an infectious disease specialist, I was getting emails from friends and family all the time about articles in the news. You've probably seen plenty of these uh, newspaper headlines of new superbug, you know, MRSA does this, or outbreak of superbug in New Mexico. But one of the things that I noticed time and time again about these articles is that there was something missing from them. And that thing that was missing was the patients. It was often a story about the bacterium, about the science behind it, which was fascinating, or about the policies that had led to this or what was being done from a policy, policy perspective to address it kind of the 30,000 foot view, but it was missing the thing that I was seeing all the time, which was the patients who were coming into the emergency room, who were scared and who were vulnerable, and their stories weren't being told. Um, part of that is because the journalists who were writing these articles didn't have access to them. And I'm gonna talk a little bit later today about that issue of writing about patients, real patients, and how that's a, a, a tricky subject. But for someone like me who writes all the time about medicine, uh, it's a, a crucial aspect of telling these stories. So a few years ago, um, I was in the emergency room of New York Presbyterian, and a patient came in. Uh, I call him Jackson. He was an African-American mechanic from Queens. 
and he had been shot, and there was a bullet lodged in his leg. And the area surrounding the bullet was infected. And when I was peering over to see him, I had a team of medical students and residents with me, and one of them handed me a piece of paper, which revealed the results of a microbiological test. And when I looked at it, my eyes bulged, because it showed that the bacterium that was in his leg was a superbug. It had become resistant to every antibiotic that we had at our disposal except for one. And that one was something called colistin. I don't know if there are any clinicians in the room or pharmacists, but colistin is a very strong antibiotic that was discovered more than a generation ago. And it was something that we stopped using 25 years ago because it is so toxic. So colistin is really good at destroying uh, bacteria, but it also can destroy your kidneys in the process. It can destroy your brain. It can destroy internal organs. So years ago, we made the decision as doctors to stop using it because it was simply too toxic. But I found myself staring into the eyes of this nervous guy saying, I might have to use this drug which could potentially clear your infection, but might wipe out your kidneys in the process and might put you into di on dialysis, might totally ruin your life because of a skin infection. And so a number of things were round, popping through my head as I was seeing this guy. Uh, one of which was, I'm on the ethics committee, and I found myself dealing with an ethical issue, which is, can I ethically justify treating this guy's infection if I might destroy other organs in the process? One of the other things I was wondering is, why did a stray bullet from Queens have a superbug on it? How did that happen? And then more importantly, why didn't we have any better treatment options for him? So all of this was spinning around in my head and it was in that moment that I decided to write my book. And if you flip through the pages of it, you'll see that anecdote is what begins my story. And from there, what happens? And what happens to Jackson? And it becomes one of many patients who I follow and who I continue to follow. Uh, I gave a talk, uh, not lo far from here actually, and at, at the end of the talk somebody came up to me and said, hey, remember me? I'm, your, I'm in your book. I had the super bug. You cured me. I said, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> so if anyone here has seen me before, please raise their hand <laughs> and, and let me know. Um, but what happened was after I saw Jackson, I walked across the hall to my mentor. And the reason that I am known as the yeast infection guy is that I trained with the world expert in yeast infections. It's a guy named Tom Walsh, and he is an expert in infectious diseases, pediatrics, hematology, oncology, pathology, and fungal infections. And I met him a dozen years ago, and immediately decided this is the guy who I want to work with. And when I went into his office that day after seeing Jackson, he had this big smile on his face, and he said, I've got an opportunity for us. And really, Matt, it's an opportunity for you. And that opportunity was to run a clinical trial with a new antibiotic that had just been approved by the FDA. It's a drug called Dalbavancin. And the reason we were going to study it is that our hospital, like many hospitals around the country, was in a standoff with the maker of that antibiotic. It was this really powerful new drug that could cure a superbug infection, many superbug infections. But the company said, we're going to charge $4,000 a dose. And my hospital said, thank you, but no thank you. And that was the standoff. So we weren't carrying it. And that led me on this quest to understand how did we get to this point. One of the biggest misconceptions about superbugs is that we're running out of antibiotics. But this isn't true. There's antibiotics being approved by the FDA all the time. There was a new antibiotic approved last month called Cefidrocol. My hospital doesn't carry it. It's not going to carry it. I guarantee you your hospital doesn't either. And we're going to talk about why that is and what's being done about it, because there's a lot being done about it. Um, there are one of, one of the most exciting things about working with superbugs is that every day is full of discovery. People are discovering new antibiotics all the time, and I help figure out whether they should continue studying it and what patients will need it most. And that's the thrill of doing this job. But I think before diving into the present and the future, it's useful to know a little bit about the past and how we got into this situation. 
because there's a few key points that I want you to be able to take away from today's talk so that when you're over a glass of wine discussing the superbugs guy, some key points. Um, one of them, the first, which I've already mentioned, is that superbugs is a very broad topic that includes bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites that are resistant to the treatments we normally use. And the question is, how did we get to this point that we have these pathogens, these microbes, that have become resistant to treatments? And I'll say before I go a step further is to say that a lot of doctors don't like the term superbugs. In fact, a month after my book came out, I got an email from a professor at the Cleveland Clinic who said, you know, Dr. McCarthy, you really shouldn't call it superbugs. You should call it difficult to treat infections. And I said, well, it's not much of a book title. And the more I thought about it, I said, you know, the tricky thing about superbugs is that they're not always difficult to treat. And when I was talking, emailing with this guy, what I said was, I would just come from the emergency room where I saw a man with an E. coli superbug infection that was resistant to eight different antibiotics. But that E. coli was susceptible to Leviquin, a pill that I just gave him and sent him home. It turned out it was actually relatively easy to treat. So just because a bacterium or a microbe is resistant to an antibiotic doesn't mean you have no treatment options. It just means that they can be a challenge sometimes to treat. And so I want to give you a little perspective on how we got here. And that will inform us in terms of where we're going. So many people are familiar with the first commercially available antibiotic, something called penicillin. Probably learned about it in school a long time ago, but I'll hit the highlights, which are that in the late 1920s, a guy named Alexander Fleming was fumbling around in his laboratory just up from Paddington Station in London. And he noticed something interesting, which is that he had a Petri dish that was normally covered with bacteria. And he found that there was a big chunk on that Petri dish where the bacteria had all died. And it had died around the presence of a fungus. And he put two and two together and said, I think this fungus is making a chemical, secreting a chemical that kills the staph, that kills bacteria. And he said, I think this is a big deal. This chemical might be able to kill off other bacteria. But he didn't realize how important what he had discovered. And in fact, he let the idea fade away. And it wasn't until the early 1940s that investigators at Oxford University revisited his initial discovery and started doing more research. And they figured out that he had stumbled upon a fungus that produced this chemical called penicillin. And that became the first commercially available antibiotic, which by the end of World War II, we were widely distributing to soldiers and then to people all over the world. Following that came a second antibiotic, something that we now call the sulfa drugs, sulfonilamide. It was created by a German scientist who was doing his experiments as in the 1930s in Nazi Germany. Uh, his name was Gerhard Domach. I tell the story of, of Domach because he wasn't a Nazi. He was one of the few who refused to return the Hitler salute, the Hail Hitler salute. And when he won the Nobel Prize for discovering the sulfa drug, Hitler threw him in jail. But those two discoveries, back to back, of penicillin and sulfa drugs, ushered in, in the 1950s, what we call the golden era of drug development. The 1950s was a period where every few months, a new antibiotic hit the market. Life expectancy blossomed. There was all of these new discoveries hitting the market, new antibiotics every three months. And it seemed like the possibilities were limitless. That story is actually one you may have heard in grade school. It's one that has been told to a lot of people. But what hasn't been taught is what happened after that golden era. And that's where a lot of the research for my book came. If there was so much optimism and so much wonderful discoveries, why are we in this situation with superbugs? Part of that begins in the 1960s, when a number of prominent scientists, including Nobel laureates, came out and said, you know, we got this infectious disease issue kicked. We should start focusing on other conditions like heart disease, like cancer. And the pharmaceutical industry, the burgeoning pharmaceutical industry at that time, took their cues from these scientists and said, okay, you think there's 
more we could be doing with heart disease and cancer and diabetes and eye disease, okay. And so they started aggressively making new drugs to help people with those conditions. And it turned out it was very profitable. And it wasn't until, and, and I can tell you how powerful that shift was. In the 1970s and 80s, there were no new classes of antibiotics created. We still had the, the marvelous ones that were discovered in the 50s, but we weren't looking ahead. And it wasn't until the 1990s that we began to appreciate the scope of this problem. In the 1990s, we started seeing superbugs. We started seeing bacteria that had been mutating all along, kind of under cover, behind our backs, while we weren't looking. And the way this happens is every time a human takes an antibiotic, let's say there's a trillion bacteria living in your body, in your colon. You take a Z-Pak for a sinus infection. 50% of those bacteria, let's say 80% of those bacteria will survive. But a small portion of them will mutate. And they'll mutate in a way to become resistant to that Z-Pak the next time you take it. And these bacteria are constantly evolving all the time so that the more antibiotics the see, they see, the more resistant they become. And so it was in the 1990s that we developed these very sophisticated diagnostic tests where we could say, whoa, that simple staph infection has become resistant to our antibiotic called methicillin. And methicillin-resistant staph is what we call MRSA. You probably have heard of MRSA before. It's one of the most famous superbugs. MRSA is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or simply a staph infection that's resistant to a particular antibiotic called methicillin. So in the 1990s, we started doing all these surveys and looking at the ground, looking at the hospitals, and saying, whoa, we have a lot of superbugs. We need the pharmaceutical industry to start making new antibiotics. You know what they said? Not sure we want to. There were a number of studies which came out that showed that when a pharmaceutical company invests in a new antibiotic, they typically lose $50 million. Now, why would that be? People need antibiotics. Well, think about a doctor like me. Let's compare an antibiotic to a blood pressure drug. If I see you in my office, I'll say, here, take, your blood pressure is high. Take this pill once a day, every day for the rest of your life. That is a great business model. Compared to an antibiotic, which I'm going to be stingy about doling out, I'm only going to give to you in short courses, and even that wonderful antibiotic is eventually going to encounter drug-resistant microbes, which render it useless. So the pharmaceutical companies are looking at the finances and saying, I know you guys want us to make new antibiotics, but what's in it for us? Every once in a while, they make a blockbuster drug, but by and large, not worth it. So this brings me to the second point that I want you to remember from today, which is that there are a lot of new proposals that are on the table to entice the pharmaceutical industry to start making antibiotics again. You haven't heard about these yet, but you're going to start hearing about these both at the local level and uh, on the level of presidential debates and beyond. This is going to be a major issue moving forward. So the first thing is called a push incentive. And I'll give you an example. In my book, I chose to write about this one particular antibiotic called Dalbavancin. It's made by a pharmaceutical company called Allergan, which is a Dublin-based pharmaceutical company. So Allergan also makes Botox. Botox had $3 billion in sales last year. You can go to a company like Allergan, which is very good at making antibiotics if they want to, but they're losing interest and say, you know, your corporate tax rate is 18%. What if we cut it to 15%, provided that you promise to invest a portion of those excess profits into new antibiotics? How do people feel about that? I can tell you that I have mixed emotions. I work very closely with the pharmaceutical industry, trying to figure out strategically what drugs they should develop to meet the needs of our patients. You know, when I first heard about it, I was following the trials in Oklahoma of Johnson & Johnson uh, and other companies that had misled the public about the opioid epidemic. The idea of giving them a tax cut wasn't all that uh, great of an idea to my mind, but on the other hand, it's a surefire way 
to get these companies to do this. Then there's something called a pull incentive. A pull incentive is to go to a company like Allergan and say, when you develop a new antibiotic and it gets approved for use by the FDA, you typically get five to seven years of market exclusivity, which means that no generic can go on the market, nobody can compete with you, it's just yours alone. Well, rather than giving you five to seven years, what if we gave you 25 years? So that if you put in the effort to get a drug approved, typically a billion dollar investment, we're gonna really reward you handsomely. Well, this idea of market exclusivity is a really powerful one. I'll give you an example. Allergan, the company I work with, also makes Restasis, which is an eye drug. And they had an idea recently. This is publicly available knowledge. But the patent lawyers at Allergan said they cooked up a, a, a scheme where they discovered that there's something called tribal sovereign immunity, which is that if a Native American tribe owns a patent, no one else can compete with it. So Allergan decided to transfer their patent to Restasis, to a Native American tribe, because they were about to go up against generic competitors with the idea that they would split the profits. I had mixed emotions about this as well. Thought they were exploiting a group that had already been exhaustively exploited. And when I asked people about it, I got very different responses. The doctors I work with said, that's crazy. But patent lawyers I know say, that was brilliant. But ultimately, a judge threw this out and said, this goes against the spirit of the law. But I share that with you because these push and pull incentives, which affect things like market exclusivity, are really powerful. And this is not a debate that has entered the public sphere yet, but it's something that we in infectious disease and in the clinician community, we argue about ad nauseum in um, uh, academic meetings. So that's the, only the first half of the debate, which is to say, should we do push and pull incentives for these companies that could potentially help us? Then there is an emerging argument which says, if these companies don't want to make treatments for superbugs, well, good riddance. The federal government should do it. We should look at antibiotics the way we look at electricity and water, that these are public goods. That what we should really do is disentangle dollars and cents, disentangle profit from this whole idea, this whole mess, and just pool our resources. We could pool it with the European Union, with Australia, whoever else wants to be a part of it, and spend money on the most promising drugs so that we all can benefit from them. And this whole idea of trying to beg these pharmaceutical companies to make new drugs for us is crazy. Now, I travel around the country and around the world, frankly, talking about this idea. And I have found a wide variety of responses to it. I can tell you that I was against it when I first heard about it. And in my book, I, I interview people, uh, people at the National Institute of Health, people in the federal government to say, this is a provocative idea, what do you think? The first person I interviewed was a guy named Tony Fauci. He's the head of the NIAID, part of the National Institute of Health that sets priorities in infectious diseases. You've probably seen him during the, when we had the congressional testimony about the Ebola outbreak. You've probably seen him talking about Wuhan virus. He's a very smart guy. And I said, what do you think? Should we have the federal government make antibiotics? He said, definitely not. You do not want the federal government to be a pharmaceutical company. And I said, well, why is that? And he explained to me, which I will relay to you, his thoughts on this. That for the last 30 years, we have had a public-private partnership where the NIH, the federal government, is very good at selecting scientists and giving them multi-million dollar grants to do their science, to make discoveries to find molecules that could potentially be antibiotics. But after those molecules are discovered, things become very risky and very complicated. Let's say that I was in my laboratory doing an experiment and I find you could pick a chemical, zinc oxide. If I find that zinc oxide kills superbugs, well, I can't just start giving it to humans. I have to do all kinds of experiments in test tubes, and then in animals, 
typically two different types of animals. Often we use mice and we use New Zealand white rabbits. Then you do studies in humans. Phase one trials in humans, which are healthy human volunteers. Then phase two trials to see if the drug actually works. And then phase three trials, which are what we call the pivotal trial, which says, does your new discovery, say zinc oxide, better than the existing stuff on the market? That whole process typically takes at least 10 years and a billion dollars of investment. Right now, the way it works is our government invests in scientists to make that discovery, and then those scientists pair off with the private pharmaceutical companies who put the money down for the billion dollar investment. Nine out of 10 of those investments fail. So best case scenario is that a company needs to invest $10 billion to get one of those discoveries to work. And when they do, they want a return on their investment, which is why I was in a standoff with Allergan about their $4,000 a dose drug. None of this was apparent to me, despite the fact that I had studied molecular biophysics in college, went to Harvard Medical School, did my training at Columbia Presbyterian, and I had been a faculty member at New York Presbyterian. But I decided that this was a really interesting thing to look at. How are we going to do this? And so I set about designing a clinical trial, which I found to be much more difficult than I ever expected. And that's what my book ends up being about. Because I became the principal investigator introducing a new drug to one of the top hospitals in the world. And it turns out you can't just walk in and say, hi, I've got this new drug, Dalbovance, and I'd like to give it to patients. And the reason for that is that they don't trust people like me doctors to do experiments that are in your best interest. And they have very good reason to be suspicious. And history is littered with stories of doctors who were once left to patrol themselves to decide what was ethical and what wasn't, committing egregious crimes against patients, things that have been widely reported, but also more subtle things. And as someone on the ethics committee, uh, I was acutely aware of all of this. I think many people are familiar with the Nazi doctors. Uh, there's a book I quote called Doctors from Hell about the experiments they did. But that was, that was only one thing. There was many more stories. I think people have also heard about Tuskegee, where we had government-funded scientists who were intentionally withholding treatment for syphilis from Alabama sharecroppers. And it wasn't that they decided to treat some of them and not some of them. They just never told them that a new treatment had come that could completely eradicate their infection. And syphilis is something that you can pass sexually transmittedly. You can also pass it congenitally, congenitally. So these were people who were spreading this infection to their wives, to their unborn children. And this went on for decades. Started in the 1930s. Finally ended in the 1970s when a whistleblower stepped forward and said, do you realize what's happening? The truth was nobody did, until there was congressional testimony. And the Tuskegee incident shed to light the kind of transgressions that doctors had been committing for generations. Things like injecting viruses, herpes viruses, into mentally defective children, or sterilizing people against their will, or injecting cancer cells into people for experiments. All of this was done, in some ways, privately, but in other ways it was out in the open. The doctors were writing about this in academic circles because doctors were policing themselves. And when all of this came to light in the mid-1970s, a new institution was born, which was called the Institutional Review Board, the IRB. So every hospital now has a board, an IRB, which looks at clinical trials and the ethical dimensions of it so that the next time you're in a hospital, if somebody like me comes up and says, hey, would you like to be a part of my clinical trial? It has to be approved by that IRB. And they ended up being an unexpected nemesis for me because I spent nearly a year trying to write a protocol, trying to design a trial that they would approve. And month after month, they said, this is not acceptable. And it really wounded me. I write about how difficult that was because I thought I was trying to do something very important for patients. And I was. But their stamp of approval really means something. 
And so you may find yourself in an emergency room with a doctor like me coming up to you saying, hey, do you want to be a part of this study? They can't do that unless an IRB approves it. And one of the fascinating things I found after I finally got approval was that wasn't the end of the story with the studying superbugs. The first person I approached in my superbug trial was a lawyer who had been working for a Fortune 500 company for his entire career. He's in his 70s, recently retired. I handed him this thick packet that had outlined every single aspect of the trial, what a superbug is, what the antibiotic is, how we got into this mess, how his participation was going to help us. He took one look at it, flipped through it, put it on his lap, and he said, Dr. McCarthy, I only have one question for you. Would you give this drug to your own mother? Again, it caught me off guard, kind of like the locust question I got in Richmond. And I said, well, uh, yeah, 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 yes, I would. It took me a moment to gain the confidence, but what was so fascinating to me, and I write about this in the book, is that he was able to cut through all kinds of red tape and all kinds of jargon to get to the heart of the matter, which is, how much do you really trust this process? How much do you really trust what you're doing? And the truth was, okay, the truth was, I hadn't thought about that. But once I had, a lot of stuff came very clear to me. The next patient who I went to approach was a security guard who had a 10th grade education. And one of the things I found when I asked him if he wanted to do my trial was he said, sure. And I said, well, you know, I need to get informed consent and here's the paperwork for it. And he said, yeah, sure, I'll sign wherever. And I knew that I paid for this microphone. <laughs> Can we? All right. So one of the things that I found. How are we doing now? One of the things that I found is that some people thought they needed to enroll in my trial so that I would give them good medical care which is not a position I wanted to be in, and that wasn't the truth. But it showed me what tremendous power I had over these patients. And that's one of the things, whenever things get uncomfortable for me, I like to write about it. And that makes my hospital's PR department very nervous. And that leads me to, I think, shifting gears a little bit to talk to you about how New York Presbyterian has a very aggressive PR arm and I've been bumping up into that for the last year because I've been the only person willing to talk about superbugs. And they don't like that. So I want to tell you a little story about something interesting that happened to me. So I'm going to transition a little bit and say that that story of the Dalba Vanson clinical trial, I'm going to return to that in a little bit and to the story of Jackson. But I want to leave you hanging to say that I was trying something new. I was trying to bring a new antibiotic to patients. And I found that enrolling them was really tricky because I was very good at getting consent, but I didn't always know if I was getting informed consent. And I was under tremendous pressure to enroll a lot of patients because their strength in numbers. The more patients I could enroll, the more people I could experiment on, the more information I could gather. And that was a very difficult but interesting position to be in. And so while I was doing this trial, something really interesting happened. I mentioned that I am the yeast infection guy at my hospital. And shortly after I started my trial, I started seeing patients who had a very scary superbug infection that was a yeast infection called Candida auris. Has anyone ever heard of that? Candida auris, the epicenter of this worldwide outbreak, is New York. So this brings me to point three, which is you should know about Candida auris. And I'll spell it if anyone's taking notes. Candida, 
is C-A-N-D-I-D-A, Candida. Oris, A-U-R-I-S, it's for Oracle, the part of the ear where it was discovered in a woman in Japan in 2008. So what happened was in 2008, this random yeast appeared in the ear of a woman, and we found that it was resistant to all three major classes of antifungal drugs. There were no treatments for it. 50% of the people who got it died. 50% lived, barely. And I've just spent the last 20, 30 minutes laying out for you why it's so difficult to get the pharmaceutical industry to make an antibiotic, to make something to treat bacterial infections. Well, if you think it's difficult to convince them to make one for a bacterium, how hard do you think it is for them to make an antibiotic or an antifungal drug for an obscure yeast infection? Very difficult. So we started writing these articles about Candida auris and the fact that we desperately needed new treatments. And my hospital became a referral center. People got shipped in to see me from all over the world who were desperate. And we cured most of them, actually. And then in July of 2018, I got a call from a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist from the New York Times. And he said, Dr. McCarthy, I hear that you have been treating patients with Candida auris. And I said, well, yes, I have. And he said, I heard that a number of them survived. I said, that's true. And he said, I'm writing an article, in fact, a series of articles about Candida auris, and I'd like to talk to some of these patients. And I said, well, you know that I, there's something called HIPAA, patient privacy laws. I can't give you their contact information. But this was a savvy journalist, and he said, no, no. I'm not asking for their contact. Why don't you give them my contact? Put the ball in their court. If they want to talk, they can. If not, no big deal. Well, what do you think about that? I wasn't sure. He was correct. It wasn't against the law for me to pass along their contact info. But I also thought back to who these patients were and what they had gone through in my hospital. One of the men was a guy who ended up having 15 surgical procedures because we couldn't treat the, the Candida auris with a drug. We had to cut the darn thing out. And we kept being unable to get all of it. And so procedure after procedure, this guy went through a very difficult time. He had a two-year-old child. He wanted, the kid, he wanted to see his kid, and we said, you can't bring the kid in, it's too risky. And so I decided not to give my patients this journalist's contact info. I think you could debate whether that was right or wrong. I'm still not sure. But something interesting happened, which was eight months later, on April 9th of 2019. It was a front page article in the New York Times about Candida auris. And the headline was, Mystery fungus spreads around the globe amidst a climate of secrecy. And that secrecy was because of doctors like me who didn't give them access to patients. And you can read that, quote, uh, that article, and I'm quoted in it. I gave a very long quote about how the doctors and residents and nurses at my hospital are so good that when a patient comes in in the middle of the night with candida auris, that by the time I come in the next morning at 7 a.m. for rounds, there's very little for me to add. They've done so much, ex executed things so well, that I'm often left wondering if I should even examine the patient. What little am I going to bring to this? In fact, the only thing I could be doing is potentially picking up that superbug and bringing it to other patients. So I'm not even sure I want to do that. Well, that quote got truncated to say that a fungal expert's not sure he even wants to examine these patients. And so then two things happened after that article went live because it established me as one of the experts on this new superbug. So I got a call from Good Morning America. And they asked if I wanted to come on and talk about Candida auris. And I said, I would love to. I've spent my career designing diagnoses, diagnostic tests and new treatments, and we've come up with a way to save lives. I would love to talk about it. Then I got a second phone call from my hospital's PR department, and they said, we are going to politely decline this interview request on your behalf. And I said, can you do that? And they said, we already did. And I said, well, why, and this is again in April of last year, I said, now why would you want to do that? 
this is shedding light on a really important public health topic. I'm not some wacko. I'm going to talk about the evidence and the facts and how we're saving lives. This will reflect, I think, in a, in a good way uh, about on the hospital. And they said, well, Dr. McCarthy, we appreciate where you're coming from, but ultimately, we don't want our hospital associated with superbugs. And I said, well, I have some very bad news. I have a book coming out in three weeks called Superbugs. And it's about our hospital. Uh, and I've been trying to get it in the hands of the PR department for nine months because I tell the story of one of my family members who got a superbug and how he was treated at our hospital and the wonderful story of how a team came together to save him. And they said, <laughs> what? <laughs> you have a book on superbugs? And what they did was they ended up putting me through something called media training, which is that they hired an investigative journalist, they put a camera on me, and they got a bunch of the front office brass to come and watch me answer questions about superbugs, grilling me as though I, could, I was a, a loose cannon that might say something that makes their hospital look bad. And I'll give you an example. Earlier in this uh, talk, I said to you all that when I go home at night, I'm not worried I'm going to transmit a superbug to my two young children. When I said that, they freaked out. And they said, no, no, you don't want to say not worried. You want to say, I am confident that I will not transmit this to others. And that was the level of wording that they were concerned about. And at the time, I thought that that was a misguided. And in fact, I wrote an op-ed in response to my hospital's PR. I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. And the first line of it was, hospitals are losing an important PR battle because their policy, which is one that remains today, is no comment. And what you will see is that there have been a number of articles that have since come out about Candida Oris, about people dying, and the families will say, we want the hospital to talk about what happened so that this doesn't get spread to other people, so that we can increase awareness. And the hospitals time and again say no comment. And I wrote, no comment is no longer acceptable. And it was a very fine line to walk because I like my job. I really like my job. Uh, but I was not okay with this approach. And it, I think, speaks to the fact that we as uh, doctors and as the scientific community are really struggling with how to talk about this issue. And that's the reason I'm here today, is because I want to talk about this issue. I don't want you to be fearful of it. I walk into a hospital every day. There may be superbugs in this room. That doesn't mean they're going to kill you. And part of that is understanding why. And the other part that I highlighted in this op-ed that I wrote is I acknowledge something that the New York Times was trying to do. They want hospitals to publicly report every superbug that's found within their walls. The idea being that this is a public health issue and that you deserve to know. There is an argument for why that's the case, but what I pointed out is that without context, this means nothing. A long list of Latin names is going to look basically like the terms and conditions for your iPhone. You're not going to know what to make of it, because I wouldn't know what to make of it. If you swab the inside of my nose, there could be superbugs in there. What does that tell you? It doesn't tell you anything. It also doesn't tell you anything if I have a patient with a superbug infection, if you list that publicly, it doesn't tell you if I cured them or if I didn't cure them. And so what I pointed out was that the best hospitals are going to see more Superbugs. Why would that be? It's because we have the most sophisticated diagnostic techniques that can detect these things. We have the most powerful antibiotics. We have the experts who know how to treat them. And we also take on the cases that appear lost. And you're going to disincentivize us doing that, us taking on those difficult cases, if you think that that's going to be publicly reported and somehow hurt our institution's credibility. But as this story has unfolded, I've come to appreciate where my hospital's PR department is coming from. I have friends who work for the New York State Department of Health, and they say that they routinely get phone calls from people who say something to the effect of, I'm about to put my mother in a nursing home, and I want to know if it has superbugs or not. So people are concerned, and it could hurt a place's image. And so we're trying to figure out what the right thing to do here is. But I'll tell you, in November, the New York Times got their way, 
And hospitals in New York, the only state in the country, now all report which ones have Candida auris. You can go on online and see if Melville, I don't know what the nearest hospital is from here, but you'll be able to see whether it's had this fungus. It also doesn't tell you anything about the patients, but it tells you whether it's had it or not. Which brings me to, I think, the next topic, which is now that we know that these antibiotic-resistant and drug-resistant microbes are in our environment, what are we doing to find new treatments? And there's two things I want to talk about. The first is phage therapy. I don't know if anyone has heard about this, but this is a fascinating new development. If you're keeping, taking notes, phage is P-H-A-G-E, phage, which is short for bacteriophage. So over close to 100 years ago, it was discovered that there are these naturally occurring viruses called bacteriophages. Some people pronounce them phage. I say phage which can cause bacteria to explode. And there was a lot of t work in the 1970s and 80s, mostly in Eastern Europe, places like Lithuania and Latvia, where they were developing bacteriophage therapy to treat infections. But for whatever reason, it just kind of fell by the wayside. But we have found that it's coming back. And it came back in a big way in May of this year, a month after the Candida auris story hit. And I'll say that the Candida, we'll get back to the Candida auris in a minute, but just to say chronologically, the next big thing to happen with superbugs was the return of bacteriophage. And the way this works was exemplified in the treatment of a 15-year-old girl from London who had an infection in her lung with a superbug called Mycobacterium abscessus. It was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal that this girl had gone through two years of antibiotic treatment <clears throat> without cure. And they had cured her using phage therapy. And the way they did it was with something called CRISPR. People familiar with CRISPR? It is an enzyme. I don't want to get this into be a science lesson, but there are certain things that you can, I think, take away from and, and go dig deeper into. And one of them is CRISPR, which is C-R-I-S-P-R. CRISPR is a molecular scalpel that allows us to chop up DNA, and it allowed us to chop up this phage treatment. And so they created three phages, they gave them to a girl, and they cured her. Success. And I was immediately asked to comment on this, and they said, well, what do you think about it? And I said, well, I think I'm very happy for this girl, but the problem with phage therapy is that it is incredibly narrow spectrum. What I mean by that is that when people try to develop new antibiotics, they want broad spectrum. They want an antibiotic that can broadly treat every bacterium in this room, every infection you may have. They don't want something that can only treat you. But that's essentially what phage therapy does. It's essentially personalized medicine. It's precision medicine. But there's a downside to that, which is that someone has to study it to make sure it's safe. These things, we don't know much about them. I certainly wouldn't give it to my own mother, yet. And the question is, who's gonna take up investing billions of dollars in something that could only treat, let's say, mycobacterium obsessus affects a few hundred people a year? The finances become very thorny, and it looks to be a place, potentially, where the federal government could pick up the slack. If you're somebody who's out there who likes having the government involved in your health care, this would be a great opportunity for them to do more. So phage therapy, is, and there's a book about this um, called The Perfect Predator, about a woman whose uh, husband was saved using phage therapy. And I will say that that is something that we're going to be hearing more about in 2020 and beyond. But there's something else that's even more exciting about where we're looking for the next cures for superbugs. And that's in the soil beneath our feet. This will be point number five that I'd like you to take away from this, which is that the soil is an incredible place for antibiotic discovery. Why would that be? Well, if you recall what I told you about Alexander Fleming, 
that what he discovered was that there was this fungus that was making a chemical, secreting a chemical into the environment that could kill bacteria. Well, it turns out that in the soil beneath our feet, there are trillions of microbes in every square meter of soil that are engaged in a subterranean warfare, survival of the fittest, where they are all secreting little chemicals. Some of those chemicals are designed to kill others. Some of those chemicals are designed to find like-minded microbes, something called quorum sensing, where a bacteria will submit a, send out a little chemical that will identify other bacteria that are similar to it. But the thing we're interested in are the bacteria that are secreting chemicals that are designed to kill other bacteria. Because if you think about it, if we can pluck one of those out, we've got ourselves an antibiotic. And so what we're doing, largely at the Rockefeller University in Manhattan, is we're using artificial intelligence to try to identify where we should hunt for more antibiotics. And as a proof of principle, one of the researchers I work with, a guy named Sean Brady, he asked people to send in soil from Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And he collected the samples, and he found more than two dozen new drugs. It's incredible. The question is, what do you do with those findings? Because as I said, any new chemical that you find in the dirt requires at least a billion dollars worth of investment and testing before you know it's safe. And I'll tell you that Sean Brady found in the soil a new drug to treat MRSA. It's called malacidin. If you want to look it up, M-A-L-A-C-I-D-I-N. And he met with me, and he is rapidly producing more malacidin. And I said, great, can I come over to your laboratory and see? And he said, oh, we're making it in China. And I said, okay, well, when you have enough of it, let's test it. Because he's shown that it can kill MRSA. And so what I do is I then would study it in rabbits and in mice and then in humans. And the way we're trying to figure out where that we should look is through artificial intelligence, which really blew my mind when I first heard about this. And the idea is that many of the antibiotics that we use today have similar structures. You ever see the structures a chemist will draw on the board that's got all these stick figures? Well, those are atoms that are separated in space. And what we can do is train a computer to say, okay, so penicillin looks like this. Look for something that looks like this but has a little extra something else on it. And we can rapidly scan through literally tons and tons of soil trying to find things that are, look like the antibiotics that we know are safe and effective, but are a little bit different. And then something interesting happened after we've started this hunt in the soil is that I was contacted by The Atlantic, which is uh, the, the magazine. And they said, we'd like you to comment on this new in, um, quest led by Craig Venter, the guy who uh, sequenced the human genome. He thinks the next great place to find antibiotics is at the bottom of the ocean. I said, really? That's news to me. But it led me on a quest, and one of the reasons I enjoy doing this is that I learn every day something new. And his theory is that at the bottom of the ocean must be some extraordinary organisms that can live in such harsh environments. And whatever's down there, if we can scoop them up and bring them back, they've probably got something important to tell us about survival. It's an interesting idea. I wouldn't want to invest in it, but if a billionaire wants to invest in it, I think it's a reasonable approach. We're also looking in the tundra. People are going to the Arctic, the Antarctic, and looking to see, is there anything alive deep down in the ice? And this is one of the, I think, wonderful stories about superbugs and about life, is that it finds a way. And we're trying to learn from everything around us how can we figure out ways for our species to survive, learning from some that are able to survive for thousands of years? So I want to pause there, because I want to leave some time for questions. And I know people have a lot of questions about this stuff. And while you're thinking about your questions, 
I'll tell you and wrap up some of the loose ends that I've started with um, in my story. I began with that patient, Jackson, who had been shot. He ended up getting colistin, and it gradually deteriorated his kidneys. Eventually, we found that the antibiotic wasn't working, and his bacterium became resistant to colistin. And at that point, we reached essentially what was a pre-antibiotic era. We had no other treatments for him, and we had to surgically remove the infection. And that's what we did in the pre-antibiotic era. We cut things out. Think about biting the bullet and cutting off someone's leg. That was because they had an infected lesion on their leg, and we didn't want it to leach into the blood. Because when infection gets into the blood, that's when problems result. Because it can go to the heart, the brain, the kidneys, the liver, and be a big problem. I also want to tell you what happened with the, the antibiotic. So this antibiotic had been approved, Dalbovancin, in 2014. And my hospital said, we're never going to use it. It's too expensive. I ran this trial, the one that I write about in my book. And I don't want to give away too much. But it was such an extraordinary result that my hospital convened a special meeting and unanimously approved it. And it was a bittersweet moment for me. It was, I was happy because we were adding this new drug, but I was frustrated that it took years of study and wasted time and effort. And I thought about all the patients who hadn't had access to it. And that process highlighted yet another challenge for antibiotic makers, which is that when they finally get their drug approved by the FDA, it's not like every hospital suddenly takes it up and says, okay, we're gonna use this now. They have something called a formulary committee. The formulary committee looks at things like dollars and cents, and they buy in bulk. So if there are two similar antibiotics, they could go to both companies and say, make us a deal. That means that a lot of antibiotics don't end up on your formulary, which is different than for heart disease or cancer. When a new heart disease drug comes out, we add it. When a new cancer drug comes out, we add it. Part of that has to do with the money that we make off of these types of diseases. We don't make much money off of infections. I can tell you, I, I was told not to go into infectious diseases as a field. I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times pointing out that no one wants to be an infectious disease doctor anymore. The title that I gave it was, Where Have All the Infectious Disease Doctors Gone? They switched it to make it a little more clicky. It said, The Scary Shortage of Infectious Disease Doctors. I keep that in mind every morning when I read the news and I feel dispirited about all of the headlines. And I think, well, if they change my headline to make it sound scarier, I'm probably doing that for literally every other article that I'm going to read today. And I just try to keep that in mind that I'm much happier when I'm thinking that someone's trying to manipulate me. <laughs> because I don't think the world's as bad as it seems when I'm reading the news. And then I'll add, I want to add another thing about... so. Dalba Vanson got approved, and that opened up a new pathway for me to do research. All of these companies started coming to me and saying, hey, can you get my drug on the formulary? And that put me in an ethically uh, perilous position because I don't want to be some shill for, the for, the, for the, the, these companies. But they're very nervous, the ones that make antibiotics, and they point to a company called Achaogen. This is point number six if you want to look up. Achaogen is... A-C-H-A-O-G-E-N. They make an antibiotic called plazomycin. P-L-A-Z-O-M-I-C-I-N. Which was approved by the FDA in June of this past year. Sorry, of June of 2018. To tremendous fanfare. People said, we've got a new drug for superbugs. Nine months later, the company was bankrupt. And the reason for that is when the FDA approves a new drug for superbugs, they don't give it blanket approval and say, you can use plazomycin for whatever you want. They give it for specific indications like a urinary tract infection or a pneumonia or a bloodstream infection. And these companies gamble heavily on what they're going to get approval for. And they gambled wrong. It was approved for urinary tract infections, and we don't need a new drug for that. Stock price plummeted. Company went bankrupt. Three months after the company went bankrupt, the World Health Organization added plazomycin to the list of essential medicines. So this company invested a billion dollars to make a drug 
that the WHO thinks is essential, and they couldn't make a single dollar off of it. Which leads credence, lends credence to the idea that maybe these companies shouldn't be doing this at all. I'm not going to weigh in on that. You can read my book and you can see what you think about that argument. But you will be hearing more about this idea that the federal government should be the one who's looking after you and looking after in the whole field of infectious diseases and antibiotics. And there's a number of topics I haven't hit on yet, which I'd be happy to address in the Q&A or I'll hang around after this. Things like vaccines, things like ways to protect yourself. But I'll leave it open for questions because I see that I have about 25 minutes left and I want to make sure people get to talk. So on that note, I want to thank you all for your attention. It's been a wonderful experience speaking to you. Is this on? Can you hear me? Great. Uh, thank you. That was a great presentation. And since I have the mic, I'm going to ask the first question, one of the benefits. I'm traveling to Thailand in February, early February, and in addition to face masks, which I'm purchasing and washing my hands frequently, do you have an opinion on this Asian virus and oh, anything yes, I, I can do? Yes, yeah, so this, the, the, the question is about the, uh, the new virus that was found in the Wuhan province, the novel coronavirus. It's been given a new name, which I think is going to change because it's not very catchy. But the question is, what should we be doing? And the, the questioner mentioned face mask and aggressively washing hands. I'll just give a little bit of background about the infection so that we can be on the same page about it. So in the Wuhan province, there are a number of meat markets where people eat all kinds of unusual stuff, like snakes and bats and rats, sometimes dogs. And I have a lot, and this, I'm going to give you a long answer to this. I, have a, a big background in this. When I was a medical student, I went to hunt for the Ebola virus. I wanted to answer a very simple question, which is, Ebola pops up every 20 years, usually in Africa, and it kills several hundred, several thousand people. And then it disappears. Where does it go? What happens after 300 people die? It turns out it lives in fruit bats. And it doesn't kill the bats. And what I was able to find, the studies that I did, is that we would take what looked like volleyball nets, but where actually the netting was very finely made so that the bats couldn't pick up the sonar. On their sonar, they couldn't pick up the, the bat, the nets. And we would watch these bats overnight. In, I was in Cameroon, watching bats fly over a hill to go feed at dusk. And we would chart their flight path, and we would look for hills where they came close to the ground, and we would put up these big nets, and the bats would fly into them, and they would get tangled. And we would take the bats out, we would take a syringe, stick it directly into their heart, take the blood out, and ship it to Johns Hopkins University for studies, and study it for the Ebola virus. And it turned out that's exactly where it was. The following year, I went to, st went to look for a new uh, deadly virus called the Nipah virus, N-I-P-A-H. Turns out, it was also in fruit bats. And this coronavirus, and what we pointed out was that the most dangerous places in the world for a superbug to take over and cause a pandemic are in places where humans are eating animals that they shouldn't, such as bats. And in fact, the most recent Ebola outbreak, the 2013-2014 outbreak, was because a child got into contact with a dead bat that had the Ebola virus. And this new coronavirus, the Wuhan province, has recently been linked to bats. Now, if you ask, I don't know that that's been talked about on TV yet or in the news, but if you talk to infectious disease doctors, they'll say, yeah, no kidding, every dangerous virus in the world is in bats. It's where rabies lives, it's where Ebola lives. And what they think happened, there's been videos shown of people eating bat soup in, these, in this province. And very quickly, it started spreading. What we know so far, just to put it into perspective, my dad, he, he's retired, he's in Florida. He said, do I got, hey, he's got a thick Irish Catholic Boston accent. He said, hey, Matty, I got to be worried about this Wuhan thing? And I said, well, you're in Florida. You haven't seen your doctor in 18 months. 
if I had to pick something for you to worry about, it would be the fact that you're not getting routine medical care. That this thing is pretty far away. What we know so far is that it is not as lethal as influenza. And what we are hoping, that so far the, the numbers are that almost 5,000 people have been infected and 107, as I took the podium, had died. And those numbers, if you compare that to influenza, where last year 80,000 people died, um, it's not as dangerous as that. If you have a mask, if you're washing your hands, you're doing what you can to protect yourself. I would tell you to avoid meat markets today and for the rest of your life. Um, and, you know, what's, what I think is interesting from an, as an ethicist is this idea of quarantining 50 million people. It seems to be slowing things down. Um, I, I see that the stock market is taking a hit because of it. Um, I get asked all the time now to take calls with investors who want to know if, where the stock market's going and if there's a way to make money off of this. I've declined those calls, but this is affecting people all over the world, and the thing to remember is that it is definitely less dangerous than influenza. You know, I, I worked last week at New York Presbyterian Hospital. I'm seeing dozens of cases of influenza, and some people die from it. And so, you know, we're hoping that this will cause people to get vaccinated for influenza. Um, this year, the vaccine has 58% coverage of what's circulating. It's not perfect, but it does pr provide some protection. So I would not cancel your trip to Thailand. No intentions. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. First question. Oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, about 15 minutes ago, you mentioned that Salavanson was not approved for your hospital because it was $4,000 a pop. Now, if this was a socialized um, country as per Canada or Israel or England, would it be easier to get this drug? And, and also, how come drugs cost so much money here and so little money uh, elsewhere? So the question was, with socialized medicine, would we be, have more access to these drugs? The answer is no. So I see a lot of patients who get ended up in my emergency room because they're on an experimental cancer therapy. They are getting something which costs $30,000 a dose that may extend their life by a few weeks. And then it doesn't, and it wreaks havoc on their immune system. In my, my med school roommate lives in Sweden, and he said, we wouldn't even consider giving these to people. So our very, very, very flawed healthcare system does provide access to drugs that you don't get in other places. Um, whether that's right or wrong, I can't say. Uh, but you would not be talking about the economics of Dalbavancin if you were in, in the European Union. Um, and I will say that what we find is that in certain conditions, let's say breast cancer, we're far more willing to pay for a drug that which will extend life by a few months than we are in infectious diseases, where a drug may extend life by a few months for a few thousand dollars and we won't pay for it. Yeah, oh, I have the microphone, okay. Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Barbara, I'm a midwife, and I'm a former nurse at Presbyterian, and I'm very proud of you. I'm very proud of the work you're doing, thank you very much. And the question I have is, could you comment on Josh Axe's uh, idea of eat dirt and don't wash the organic dirt off the carrots, and, and that sort of, it, in other words, can you tell us ways to protect ourselves? Yes, I would love to have a, a mic I can walk around with, but I, I don't know if we have one. So the question was from a, a former midwife at New York Presbyterian um, about this idea that you should eat, eat dirt, leave some of the, the rind on carrots and things like that. Um, so let me back up and just say as a midwife, that my, my wife gave birth at New York Presbyterian and I have seen some of the most difficult and challenging things you could possibly see in medicine and nothing fazed me until my child was born and I almost passed out and I was so unsteady that I couldn't cut the umbilical cord. So I admire what you do. Um, the question is about how should we expose ourselves to these pathogens? And 
There is an article that got a lot of play, a lot of circulation that said, the title of it was, Let Your Kid Pick His Nose. <sighs> the truth is, it doesn't help us to raise children in sterile environments. I grew up in Alabama. I grew up playing in the backyard in a dirty uh, sand box where people were peeing and doing gross stuff. Uh, and I don't get as many infections now. And I've often wondered, is there a connection or is it maybe I just luck of the draw? I do have a plant-based diet myself and maybe that's actually helping me. But there is a lot of, uh, there is a belief that, can you hear me on this one? That if we do expose people to some pathogens early in life, that could be a good thing. But I will say there are severe caveats. When I was a kid, I went to chicken pox parties. I don't know if anyone else did this, but the idea was to transmit the virus, get it early on. We don't do that anymore. So I am hesitant to encourage people to get in harm's way. <laughs> but I also don't think you should be overly picky. So the challenge is how do you find a middle ground where you live essentially a life where you're getting exposed to things, but not to too much. Uh, and I don't have an answer for that. So I'm gonna just say that it's a struggle I have. I have two young kids, uh, and the other day I was sitting on the couch, my wife is, does kidney transplants for a job, and we looked over and my son was picking his nose, and then he ate it. My wife looked at me and goes, maybe it's good for him. <laughs> so I don't know, uh, is the short answer. Uh, but we are wrestling with that as parents and as doctors, so thank you. My question is related to the lady before me, and it's about immune system. Why 50% of these people got candida auris survive and the other one didn't? Because in the previous presentation, we heard that our immune system really has been lowered, the power it's by being... sickness, lowered. You know? Yeah, so a great question, which is, so it sounds like it's a, she was asking, it's like a coin flip if you're going to survive from Candida Auris 50-50. One of the things we find, and one of the things I'd like to stress, is that if you have a normally functioning immune system, you don't need to worry about superbugs. But, how do we answer the question of whether you have a normally functioning immune system? That is a really hard thing to answer, and it begins with a conversation with your doctor. And if your doctor can't answer that question, then maybe you need a new doctor. Because so many of the people that I see who end up in the emergency room with a superbug infection either have a medical condition that weakens their immune system and they don't know it, or they're on a medication that weakens their immune system and they don't know it. A lot of people are prescribed prednisone, for example, for arthritis, for all kinds of things. And at higher doses, that wreaks havoc on your immune system. And some people don't know that. And so it begins by just asking your doctor. And as I said, I am face to face with superbugs every single day of my working life, and I'm not walking around sick all the time. And it's because I have a normally functioning immune system. But as I write in my book, my father-in-law got cancer, he got on chemotherapy. And we immediately started treating him differently. I stopped shaking his hand. I stopped giving him big hugs, and I told him, you can't go into our moldy basement anymore because there are so many different places that had hazards. And so it's knowing about the risk profile for every person. And that's something that I do not want to have the onus be on you to figure out, but you should be in the care of somebody who can tell you. I have um, a question for you regarding vaccines. How do you feel what can you tell us about the um, HPV and the flu vaccines that are? Mm. Great question. So I could do an entire talk on vaccines, uh, but I, I believe someone else will probably be covering that topic. It's a very controversial topic. Um, I ran into this a few years ago when I wrote an article. I used to write for a website where I had a weekly column, and I talked about how they have to basically guess every year with the influenza vaccine what strains to put into it. And the way that they make the influenza vaccine every year, and I'll get to your question about HPV in a second, is that they try to predict based on what's happening in Australia, which is six months ahead of us, 
and say, okay, so here are the strains of influenza in Australia when it's their winter. Let's try to make something similar. But the process, which involves using eggs and is a really weird, archaic process, doesn't always work out the way we hope. And I wrote an article about that and how we didn't guess right one year. And the, the article, they slapped a, cl a clickbait headline on it, which was, why does the flu vaccine suck this year? And I got accused of being an anti-vaxxer who must be related to Jenny McCarthy, the prominent anti-vaxxer, I'm no, no relation. And I realized then, this was four years ago, that I have to be very careful about the way that I talk about vaccines. Um, the question was about the HPV vaccine, which is something that can prevent cervical cancer and can also prevent anal cancer. One of the reasons I went into infectious diseases, if you go to medical school, the first thing they ask you is, are you a thinker or a doer? Do you want to be somebody who does procedures, who is a doer, surgeon, or do you want to be somebody who's thinking all the time, coming up with new treatments for high blood pressure? And I found that I was more of a thinker. My previous life, I was a baseball player, and I was done with that, and I wanted to spend my time thinking. And I found in my infectious disease clinic that I had to do a procedure that I had never heard of, which was called an anal pap smear, because there were so many people getting anal cancer who didn't know about it. And then we introduced this HPV vaccine, and we saw that the rates of anal cancer and other types of cancer plummeted. And so I'm a very strong proponent of it. I know there are going to be people in the audience who aren't or, or aren't sure about it, but I think that it's been a wonderful addition. And New York Presbyterian, where I work, we have one of the world experts on HPV vaccine, a guy named Tim Wilkin. If anyone is interested, needs the vaccine or has questions about it, his last name is W-I-L-K-I-N. Adverse effects of vaccines are many. In fact, we have a whole compensation set, system set up uh, I'm going to, in the interest of time, defer that conversation, but I will say that there is a ro robust discussion to be had about the risks and benefits of uh, these vaccines. And I have an observer bias, which is that I see the benefits of it. When somebody has an adverse reaction, they don't end up coming to me. So I admit my own bias. I saw this uh, YouTube ad of a, a man, his wife had uh, toe fungus. And the fungus went into her bloodstream, and then it went into her heart and her brain, and she was about to die. Now, this man was a botanist, so he did a lot of research. And he said, how can something like a toenail fungus kill his wife and go into the heart and brain? So he did a lot of research, and he found out, like, what is this fungus? And he contacted a lot of, he found out that a lot of people in the medical community could not answer his question about what is this fungus and how could this be? So he did a lot of research, and he had found out that um, bacteria is a single cell organism and fungus is a multi cell organism. And that a lot of human beings have many, many uh, fungus in our body. And uh, he, he put together, we all are familiar with acidophilus, but he put together a herb called um, fungus eliminator that eliminates, uh, actually is, it has like seven other different Acidophilus other in there, which I cannot pronounce. But um, he's saying that, you know, um, even people who had their toenail fungus surgically removed, the fungus comes back because it's something to do with our, a lot of fungus in our body. So, oh, great question. Um, I mentioned that I'm the yeast infection guy, and it's because I was seeing things like this, where in medical school, people want to become brain surgeons and they want to become, you know, cardiologists, but I was seeing this very important subset of patients who were having things like toe fungus kill them. Nobody was talking about being that kind of doctor. That type of doctor is called a mycologist, and I ended up being drawn to a mycologist named Tom Walsh, who I mentioned at the outset of this talk, who I ended up writing the book about. And the fact that there are so few doctors who want to take care of patients with fungal infections that what he's often left to do, and now what I do, is we will get frantic phone calls in the middle of the night from somebody who will say, I've got a 15-year-old girl who's got a toe fungus and the fungus just got into her spine. What do we do? 
And that's what the book is about, how we have this very small cohort of experts to take care of this really important patient population, and the population is expanding. Because every time we come up with a new chemotherapy drug, every time we come up with a new drug like Humira, some new drug that can affect your psoriasis or your arthritis, it also affects your immune system and predisposes you to things like fungal infections. And we're not keeping up with the demand. And one of the ways that we're trying to alleviate this is with something which I think you hinted at, which is the probiotics. That there are ways with acidophilus and other types of, of good bacteria and good fungi that we can replace the dangerous ones. I will say that in the interest of time, that's an active area of inquiry, and that I'm not surprised that the toe fungus nearly killed this woman. The part that I spend a lot of time doing is going to medical students and residents around the country and pre-med people and trying to convince them that this would be a great career. Because there's nothing sexy about being the yeast infection guy, but it saves lives. And I appreciate your question. Hi, uh, thank you so much for all this information and your candor. Um, this isn't something that you hear from your regular do doctor or gastroenterologist or any specialist that I've ever been to. Um, so thank you for that. Um, my question, I had a couple of little questions, so I'm just going to lump okay. it all together. Um, during the AIDS crisis, I remember reading or hearing about um, drug therapies that skipped through that seven to ten year yeah. testing because of the urgency. Do you think that could be an option if there was some kind of a future superbug pandemic? And with, speaking of pandemics, I've read and you know learned that it's many infectious disease specialists such as yourself, especially in New York City. I saw something on a, a, a female doctor in New York City who uh, is working on making a cohort of other hos all hospitals in New York City to have a database about different types of superbugs so that they can all be informed. And she was saying that it's not a matter of if or it's when. Absolutely. Uh, I just will answer that by saying we do have an accelerated pathway for the most promising drugs. It's still very slow because it just takes time. Um, you know, this Candida auris outbreak, for example, we decided we've got to find a new drug to treat people for this, and we found one but it still takes time to make sure that it's not dangerous to give to humans. And one of the bizarre things in my field is that when we find a new antifungal drug, they give it a terrible name. So the new treatment for Candida auris is a drug called Ibrexafungurp. I don't know why they do that to us, but that drug is going through exhaustive clinical trials right now, and we created a network, which you alluded to, um, where we can recruit doctors and patients very quickly who are desperate to be experimented on. Um, it's a tricky thing, because occasionally we will find that there are people who are so sick that we think they're gonna die anyway. And we don't wanna test a drug that's gonna fail but we also don't want to withhold a drug from someone. And this brings up a really controversial topic, this right to try, which I think people have heard about. And I can tell you, I'm able to simultaneously see it from the perspective of a doctor who's studying a drug saying, we shouldn't give this drug to people who don't qualify for it because it's gonna screw up our testing and it's gonna set the project back. And then I think about my children. And if one of them had a deadly disease and there was a drug that was being tested, I would fight like hell to get that access for them. So we go back and forth about the ethics of how quickly do we disseminate promising new drugs. I just had a question regarding a long time ago, about 10 years ago, I used to hear a lot about necrotizing fasciitis. Mm -hmm. fasciitis. And I'm just curious, I don't hear about it anymore. Is it still existent? Is it still prevalent? Because so, at, I worked in a hospital, yeah. and at that time it was. So the question is, so I, I'm seeing that my time is up, so I guess I need to stop on this question. But I will say, the question was, what happened to necrotizing fasciitis? This used to be something we heard about all the time. So that describes, essentially, flesh-eating bacteria. So necrotizing means that something's dying, and fasciitis means that it's the fascia, or the area just below the muscle and the skin that's dying. Necrotizing fasciitis is not due to a specific superbug, but encompasses a type of disease where you're constantly your skin is dying very quickly. Uh, I still see it all the time. 
Um, people aren't writing about it as much, you're right. And the reason for that is that we know more. We're able to identify what the bacterium is that's causing necrotizing fasciitis. So sometimes you'll see that somebody will go um, into the Gulf of Mexico to go searching for squid or some, I don't know, whatever, and they come out and they have, uh, their arm is basically falling off. In the past, we would have said, wow, that person has necrotizing fasciitis. Now we say that person has Campylobacter jejuni uh, infect, and we're able to give it a more detailed in answer. So that's why you don't hear about it as much. So on that uplifting note, <laughs> I just want to say thank you all for these wonderful questions and for listening to a talk about superbugs. So thank you.